My name's Pat Murphy. I was born a very short distance from where I'm now sitting. In my blood, there's nothing but West Cork names, Murphy, McCarthy, O'Sullivan, Reardon. After 50 odd years of travel abroad as a journalist, I retired here. And now I live in retirement on that lovely little village, the other side of the bay. It is here in Crookhaven that I live, move, and draw my pension. We are a community of 72 souls, and at 78, I am the oldest man. The village is located on the most southerly of those finger-like peninsulas which make up the southwest corner of our country. Indeed, too often in the past, ours has been the index finger pointing the way to America for the many people who left West Cork from the quayside of this little village. But this is not the story of a sad community nor a deserted place. This is the story of a thriving, lively people, a community forged by life on this finger of land dipped into the Atlantic. For my own place is a conjunction of rocks and water from which no living is won without effort. Adversity is normal. Any success, however small, is seen as a justification of the general air of optimism and confidence in the will of God. and vitality and progress will be perpetuated. There are more jobs to keep young adults at home and lots more children than when I first came back to live here in the early 60s. And that in itself brightens a place. On our peninsula, small clustered communities cling together on the edge of the sea, looking in two directions at the same time, towards the ocean on the one hand, and on the other, to serving the scattered farms of the interior. Valley Hob, Durris, Skull, Tourmoor, Goline are all like this and at the end of the line, Crookhaven. For you can't go through Crookhaven to anywhere. The most southerly road in Ireland ends here at Billy O'Sullivan's front door. Apart from a post office and shop, the only public buildings in the village are public in the very best kind of way. They are our recreation centers and community halls. It is in them that we do our incessant talk. And maybe that is what we are all about. Talk, communications, community. Our little seafaring church is dedicated to St. Brendan and opens for evening service during the summer months. Most of the homes in the village are modest. Many have among their furnishings mementos of foreign parts or souvenirs from visiting ships. But while this is now a village of tourists and fishing, it was once a village of seafaring, men to whom the Cape meant something more distant than Cape Clear. At one time, the road into the village passed under an archway of whaleboat and ballast stones dumped in the harbour bear witness to a thriving export trade in centuries past. Long before the word tourism was coined, the village boasted two substantial hotels. I live in the only castle in this, the southernmost village in Ireland. Naturally, I don't live in all of it, because there's only one of me. I live in the east wing. As befits a castle, it dominates the entire area and the community therein. Straight on. Welcome to Castle Murphy. Now, to keep your bearings right, that is the east wing, and this, of course, is the west. Ah, that's very pleasant. Do 
But I'm often asked why it is that I retired to Ireland to die, I presume. I didn't. The parts of Ireland I'd no more love to live in than I'd live in Boston or Birmingham or anywhere else. I retired to West Cork, where I think there are the gentlest, nicest people I know, where I began life and where I'd love to finish it. There were, there were really never many moments in my life when it was absent from my mind, whether I was in Russia or in France or Germany or Italy. I never really lost memory of this place. And I could have chosen to go in a number of places to retire. I thought of Santo Stefano at one time, it's a lovely little place on the Liguria. But I would have felt all the time that I was away from the place where I wanted to be, where there's so much humor, where there's so much understanding of each other. Should there more laughs in a day here than a month in, in London or in any other big city? Apart from which, it has transcendentally beautiful views, especially of that vast ocean, which is almost infinity. Most of the homes in the village are modest. This is the raw material, the very stuff of our tourist business, a trade which affects all of us one way or another. I'm lucky. I have neither car nor bicycle, for I don't need to go anywhere for pleasure. All this delight is on my doorstep. But despite its grandeur, it is not the scenery which makes my own place special for me. It is the people, my neighbors. The village is Driscoll territory. For that's by far the commonest name. Tommy Tom is a Driscoll and a brave man who spent a lifetime minding shipping in the Irish Light Service. As well as Driscolls, we have other aristocratic names like Sullivan, Mahanen, McCarthy, Leary and Regan, and more exotic ones, Goggin, Roycroft, Tate, Tessing, Birchall, Supple, Ellis, Pyburn, Notter, Nottage, Never, and Newman. These are westerly people. Occupations and preoccupations are natural, to do with weather and crops and catches, farming and fishing, often the two together. The preoccupation is with getting to that level of, I suppose you can hardly call it affluence, perhaps sufficiency, which enables a family to be snug and the man to have a pint or a plug of tobacco when he is a mindful. I remember a local shellfisher being admonished by a storm-bound French skipper who reasoned that if the local man worked his boat around the clock and seven days a week, he could more than double his income. The local man was laconic in his reply. My family is fed, I own my own house and my car, enough is enough, more is greed. Of course, fishing here is intensive and arduous too, but this is a rugged, exposed coast with fickle weather. The fastened fisher is flagship of the little Crookhaven fleet. Like the other boats, she works shellfish, salmon, scallops, herring, whatever the seasons and markets dictate. The boats employ directly and indirectly too. Across the harbour from Cocaine, the Celtic fisheries plant processes and packs the valuable victuals for export to places where Crookhaven will be unknown and where Fastnet will be familiar only as a name of a sea area mentioned in weather forecasting. Mariners have recognized the treachery of this inhospitable coast since before Ptolemy gave special mention to it. It is the graveyard of many a tall ship and steamer, and small boats go to sea with a weather eye open. 
Nine miles out to sea, the Fast Rock is topped by a lighthouse so bright, they say, that you can read the Cork Examiner by it ashore. Whatever about that, on dark nights it lights my way to the castle. It is part of a collection of devices which tell navigators where they are and where not to go. But it was at the beginning of the present century that this locality played its most important role in communications at sea. A certain Signor Marconi lashed his gadgetry to the top of a tall pole made from three masts and commenced to transmit from Crookhaven. Later, Marconi moved his experiments to nearby Braw Head. As one of the men who worked with him told me, he took a power of divilment out of the sea. Now it is Mizzen Head signal station which takes the divilment from the sea. By electronic blips and squeaks, it can seek out and guide tankers, trampers and trawlers. The latest link in a continuum of communications stretching back to the time of Christ. But away from the airwaves, the hub of local communications is the cream. Somehow, living in a remote place makes information doubly important, and it is at the creamery in the cold light of early morning that men with horse carts, men with tractors and cars and donkeys, assemble from all parts of the parish. Men from Lissy Griffin and Clonicaline, Baltine and Ballyrissan, Dura Road and Ballyvogue, and westerly men from Tour and Cahir. papers, the post, and parochialism, an inward spiral of communication. World news from the examiner, and news from the letter of a beloved one in Boston or Birmingham. But most important of all, the swapping of local intelligence, mart prices, the time of the funeral, the price of seed potatoes, the whereabouts of the vet, communications that matter. The OPEC countries are another man's problem. It is also at the creamery that we see an example of the neighborly spirit of a community like ours. In the unloading queue, you help the man in front of you with his churns, and the man behind also. In return, you have two helpers when your turn comes. So it is in our little village. My empty gas cylinders are replaced without my asking for it to be done. A gentle voice will simply say, I thought you would want for to have me get a cylinder of gas. Everybody tries to help somebody else, and important roles are filled voluntarily. Our hair is cut by a man who is really a lorry driver. There is somebody to do the laying out if we have a death in the village, and somebody else specializes in grave digging or mending punctures, or whatever needs to be done. Before we had running water or main sewerage, Someone attended to those needs. These people were neither elected nor selected. Nobody ever appointed them to do these tasks. The need existed within the community, and quite naturally, somebody stepped in and filled that need. So we all have a job here for which life experience, or perhaps some special skill, has fitted us. Uh, I'm a scrivener. I have a typewriter. I know a lot of these little problems that arise when somebody's insurance should be filled when somebody wants to renew an insurance, or even when pensions at one time or another have to be renewed, well, I will know to whom to write and uh, will type it out for him. Um, each of us has a duty of some sort like that, and this is mine. So each day, just before two, I go down the village to catch the post. And this is where my day usually begins to fall asunder. I may drop in for a drink, and the rest of the afternoon dissolves in talk, or I may be summoned to chat with foreign visitors. But we have many, and I'm blessed with a certain linguistic ability. 70 penny della telefonata e 70 se gentilmente mi diano adesso così. Dove vuol 70? 70, sì. Mem des autres, des Belges qui l'avaient lu. Quanto per il whisky? Due ieri sera. Obviously, chatting to foreign visitors gives me another opportunity to help our little community. 
for their enjoyment of the locality is essential to our economic survival. Of course, they also brighten and enliven our social lives. So the best of that is really among ourselves in little gatherings like this one at Castle Murphy. But the barber couldn't shame me, and he had to go and leave me. He was bobbing up and down like this. Bobbing up and down like this. Bobbing up and down like this. Barber couldn't shame me, so he had to go and leave me. He was bobbing up and down like this. When I arrived back in Rasslair, I was thirsty, I declare. I called for a drink, it was rum, I think, and it left my pockets bare. I thought for to drink it down with a tumbler in my face. My chin went whop, I spilled every drop. I was bobbing up and down like this. Bobbing up and down like this. Bobbing up and down like this. My chin went whop, I spilled every drop. I was bobbing up and down like this. My own place has its share of ballads too, like this one from Fleur O'Driscoll about the coming of the bus. Communications again. On the 5th of December 1949, the course in Raven extended their line. It was victory for Goline that the bus ran till through. When outside of McCarthy's the crowd there did queue. They were not long there till the hotel did blow. And in from the north came the bus fine and slow. With a crowd there too greeted, the flag went up high. No wonder old Hackney drivers have reason to sigh. When the bus had gone out to disgust they began. A new way of living they started to plan. Says Liam it is finished, the whole thing's gone flap. I'll convert my garage into a big shop. Then Danny stood out saying no more drives to Cork. I'll chuck up the damn thing and go back to New York. I'll there buy a taxi as I did before, where passengers are plenty and money galore. And of all the boys, Tim was the smartest by far. He had looked far ahead when he bought a big bar. With it stacked up for Christmas, he'll cut quite a dash. Saying to hell what the boss, I've got plenty of cash. So now we a plan settled out in West Car. We have Liam in his big shop and down in New York. And Tim in his new bar will reign like a king. With his friends all around him sing film again. So now to conclude and to finish your song. We hope that we didn't detain you too long. With the bus from Goline we can go for a spin. And we'll think on the 5th of December again. <laughs> And that is how Golien got its bus. Five miles away, Golien is our capital, our transport terminus, our communication center. Like the other little places along our peninsula, it is invaded by the sounds and colors of the sea. Golien is our supply center. There you can buy a fathom of rope or a yard of knicker elastic, a mantle for a lamp or an elegant hickory handle for a scythe. It is our Switzerland and our Saudi Arabia, having both a bank and petrol pumps. As well as having four public buildings, again of the better kind, it provides us with our postal address and a most helpful and efficient telephone exchange. Unlike many villages of its size, which have shops carved out of the hallways and front rooms of dwelling houses, most of the buildings in Goline were purpose-built as houses of commerce during the latter part of the last century. And indeed, some have been converted back into dwellings, holiday flats, or guest houses. The tradition of trading here is a long one. 
from humble crossroads market to proud and prosperous little service center. From Goline, the circle of communication and service spirals outwards. Expeditions must be mounted to find a hardware or a chemist shop or a secondary school. Expeditions to Skibbereen or Skull or Bantry, depending on your requirements. Let's give. Uh, red, please. Six. Six twenty-six. Cork four seven eight two one. All day long, private cars and bread vans on other business okay, are on, doing favours by collecting maybe a roll of roofing felt from Bantry, a reupholstered sofa from Skibbereen, or the fan belt for an Anglia from Skull. Our exotic requirements from outlying places. Oh, and Ballady Hob. How could I forget Ballady Hob? For John O'Keefe is from there, and he and his family are, by appointment, purveyors of handmade bread to Castle Murphy. A tray of pans, ducks, wellingtons, baskets, and bracks. But this abundance should not cause us to forget that my own place, above all others, was scourged and ravaged by the famine. In the early 1840s, there were nearly 25,000 people living on the peninsula. Then the potatoes failed and the pilchards left the shores, not to return until there was nobody around to care. In 20 years, the population halved, and by the end of the century, it had halved again. But with great tenacity, man has survived on this peninsula from the earliest times. And again, we have stability in our population, perhaps even an increase. All over, new houses are being built, and old deserted buildings are being brought back, as we say. It all means more jobs, and the effects of more jobs. In the last decade, without our own locality, upwards of 50 second homes, holiday houses, have been established by reconstruction or new building, some sited in unlikely places where no house would have been built in former times, when views were hardly a consideration. All over, there is a renewing, a rejuvenation, bustle and activity. Above all, there is the vitality of the young. For me, at nearly 80, it rises my heart to see so many young people with jobs at home or with their own boats or businesses. Culturally, too, there is a renaissance. You can't have the traditional Sunday afternoon bowling with a collection of old geriatrics like me. Gone out? And Sunday is an important day for us. It has a symbolic importance for me personally because the people of my own place are not just church-going Christians, but live active lives of charity as well. While Vatican II was reassuring, it seems to me that it was anticipated here. Much of what I have observed and participated in down the years has been ecumenical in character. Here's an example of the symbolism which appeals to me. Second mass and morning service are both at noontime. Neighbors give one another lifts to church. Their ways may part for an hour, perhaps, and then rejoin. If the fashionable two traditions exist, I fail to identify them in the lives of my neighbors. And it is in the living of our lives that our beliefs are important. After church, Golin is a hive of activity. Much of the shopping for the week is done, and there is talk, talk, talk. The threads of last Sunday's conversation are picked up again. Mountain men keep their weekly tryst, and fishermen congregate after a hard-worked, lonely week at sea. Unlike the creamery chat, conversation on Sunday morning is relaxed, desultory. It is the day of rest until milking time. In the meantime, a good suit is insulation against one's occupation. There is a timeless quality about our Sunday morning. Each Sunday morning is the same as every other one, a comforting predictability. But of course, this place isn't heaven. We can be avaricious, capricious, and unkind. We are perhaps overcautious, maybe devious, but these human failings to me are no more than a reflection of our environment. 
for this can seem a mean and inhospitable place in the teeth of a gale, or after a month of rain, when three of your half dozen bullocks have died, or you've lost a costly net or a string of pots at sea. Our lives are fickle, and maybe so too are we. But we live full lives, and with more joy than grief. We feel privileged to be lifetime tenants of this enchanting place. <laughs>